We've now seen the two generals problem and the Byzantine generals problem. In the two generals problem, we assumed that nodes are honest, but messages might get lost. In the Byzantine generals problem, we assumed that messages are reliable, but nodes might be dishonest. So now, well, we should put the two together really and uh, try and design system models for system in which both nodes and networks might go wrong in various ways. And so this is really the foundation of any algorithms in distributed systems. We need to assume certain things about what properties the system is going to have. And typically we do that by uh, looking at three different areas of interest. So first of all, we need to describe how we assume the network is going to behave. Secondly, we're going to assume how nodes are going to behave. And thirdly, we need to assume how the timing in the system is going to work. So the timing affects both networks and nodes. So does, those are the three uh, aspects of a system model that we're going to look at now in this section. So let's start with networks. So I've repeated over and over again that networks are unreliable, but just to re-emphasize that there are many reasons why a message might get lost in a network. Uh, some of them are just temporary overload, a buffer gets full and so a message gets dropped. But also there are some more fundamental problems. Even if you design it carefully so that your buffers never overflow, some human operating a system might just unplug the wrong network cable. And that means the network will be interrupted for the time that this network cable is unplugged. No way around it. There are also various other curious interactions which nat with nature that happen. Uh, so Google was observing, for example, on their subsea fiber optic cables that there were strange uh, dam they observed strange damage on, on these cables and they installed some underwater cameras and actually managed to observe sharks uh, biting into their cables. You can see the video at the link here on the slide. Do watch it. It's incredibly cute. Um, on land, people have observed problems with cows stepping on fiber optic cables. So a fiber optic cable was supposed to run along a power line, uh, but ended up trailing on the ground. Cow steps on it and the cow makes enough of a kink in the cable that the light can't get through the, the kink in the fiber optic cable and thus the network link gets interrupted. This stuff really happens, honestly. So lots of reasons why a networks might fail. Let's take this to a bit more abstract level so that we can reason about it in, in a more formal way. So typically in distributed systems and when we're designing distributed algorithms, we are going to assume some kind of point-to-point -point communication. So we're going to assume that messages have one sender and one recipient, and they are sent over a bidirectional link so that the, the, the recipient can then reply back to the sender. Uh, so that's everything, the type of link we've been talking about so far. And we can then choose how, we're, how reliable we are going to assume this link is. And so the simplest model to program against is if we simply assume that the link is reliable, and that is that messages always get through. If a message is sent, then it is received. And if a message is received, then it is sent. Uh, than it was previously sent. So the, the link doesn't lose messages and the link also doesn't fabricate messages out of thin air. So a message is only received if it was sent. But we're going to assume that messages can be reordered. And so that is quite a strong assumption, of course, because links may not actually be this reliable in practice, but we'll get to that in a moment. The second assumption we could make about network links is what is called a fair loss link. So a fair loss link is one in which whenever you send a message, it has a non-zero probability of being delivered. So when you send a message, it might get through, it might not get through. But if you keep repeating the sending of that message, then we're going to assume that eventually it will get through. We're not going to make any assumptions about how long that might take. So it might take a long time until the message does finally get through. But we're going to assume that if you assume an infinitely long execution time, there will at some point within a finite amount of time be a point when every message is delivered. And uh, the third, the weakest assumption we could make about network links is arbitrary. So the network link is allowed to do anything. We can model this in terms of a malicious active adversary who modifies the network traffic. And so this actually does happen on the, on the real internet. If you're connecting to a coffee shop Wi-Fi, the owner of that Wi-Fi could be interfering with your network packets in arbitrary ways. And that means they might not just be looking at your network communication and like eavesdropping on it, but they might actually modify the packets. They might, uh, they might record packets and then replay them at some later point of time. They might pretend to be some website and spoof it. 
uh, and of course they might drop messages as well. And so an arbitrary link is allowed to do any of these things and um, and unfortunately this is actually a, a reasonable model of how the internet works today. Now a final piece of terminology that I want to introduce here is the concept of a network partition. So a network partition is just if you have some nodes where the nodes are still continuing to run fine but the communication link between them is interrupted. Usually we talk about this interruption of being for some finite period of time. So eventually the network partition does get repaired and at some point in the future they will be able to communicate again, but the period of interruption might be quite substantial. And uh, this is an important thing to keep in mind. So you might have systems, for example, where one subgroup of nodes is able to communicate, a different subgroup of nodes is able to communicate, but those two groups cannot communicate uh, between them because the network link between the two groups is interrupted. So this could absolutely happen. So now the interesting thing with the three models of network behavior is that it's actually almost possible to convert one model into another. So in particular, if we have a fair loss link, we can turn a fair loss link into a reliable link. And the way we can do that is we simply keep retrying messages until they get through. And on the recipient side, that means we might get duplicate messages. So we have to also deduplicate the messages on the recipient side. And because with a fair loss link, we are assuming that if we keep retrying, a message will eventually get through, then it is actually possible to turn this into a reliable link because we're assuming it will eventually get through. And therefore, by keep retrying, it will eventually get through. Um, of course, we're not saying anything about how long that is going to take. It could potentially take a very long time for a message to get through, but it will eventually get through. Interestingly, it's also almost possible to convert an arbitrary link into a fair loss link. And the way we can do that is by using a cryptographic protocol such as TLS. So TLS, which stands for Transport Layer Security, is what gives you the little green padlock in the browser. It's what gives you the S in HTTPS. So it's a security protocol that allows typically a client and a server to communicate in a way that is resilient to people interfering with the network traffic. So even if there's some active adversary on the network who is manipulating your network communication, the TLS protocol is able to guarantee that if the communication is successful, then it hasn't been tampered with and it is authentic communication. It hasn't been spoofed, you don't have some, some other person impersonating the website you're trying to communicate with and so on. Uh, and the communication is private because it's encrypted. And so by using a protocol like TLS, we are actually able to almost change an arbitrary link into a fair loss link. The only thing we cannot do is if the active adversary just decides to block all communication ever. In that case, of course, nothing is going to get through and you can't turn that into a fair loss link because we can't make any guarantee that eventually a message will get through if you keep retrying. Um, but if we're willing to assume that the adversary will only um, interfere, uh, say with a finite number of packets, then uh, we could say that, okay, the arbitrary link can be actually upgraded to a fair loss link. And from there through retrying and deduplication, we can actually turn it into a reliable link. So that's our model of network behavior. The next part of the system model is how the nodes behave. So of course, nodes might fail in various ways as well. And the first type of fault that we want to consider here is a crash fault. And so in the crash stop abstraction for a process, what this means is that we assume that a process might crash at any moment. And once a process has crashed, then it will never come back again. It's just dead forever. Um, so this is a simplifying assumption, of course, that it's going to be dead forever. In some cases, this is accurate. So if, you, if your node is your phone and you drop your phone in the toilet uh, and the phone is thereafter broken, you know, the phone has suddenly disappeared off the face of the earth and it's never going to come back again. It's never going to be able to communicate again. So therefore, this you can model this as a crash stop failure. So the crash might not just be a software crash. It could also be a catastrophic hardware failure where a node is simply destroyed and it will never be able to come back again. Um, but in other systems, we might want to assume actually that nodes might crash and then come back again. They might recover after some period of time. When a node crashes, we probably want to assume that any in-memory state that it had is lost. So any state that is not written to disk or to other some non-volatile storage will be lost. Um, but any 
any data that is stored in, in uh, stable storage is able to survive the crash and will still be there after the node recovers. Uh, of course, a crash recovery model nodes might still crash and never come back again. So that's still a possibility. We're just adding the, op the additional possibility that a node might recover after a crash. And the third model of nodes is Byzantine. So exactly as in the, as in the Byzantine generals problem, uh, what it means for a node to be Byzantine faulty is just it deviates from the algorithm. So we specify an algorithm that all of the nodes are supposed to follow, but a Byzantine faulty node may not follow the algorithm. It might pretend to follow the algorithm. It might, be, it might do stuff to try and make it look honest, even though it's actually behaving in some malicious way. So we're not going to constrain the behavior of a Byzantine faulty node in any way. We're just going to assume that it can do anything that it wants. Uh, including malicious behavior. And so a piece of terminology here is we can always cat categorize a node as either faulty or correct. Um, so a node is faulty if it crashes, for example, or in the Byzantine model, a, faulty is, a node is faulty if it deviates from the algorithm. A node is correct if it's not faulty. So those are the two possibilities. Now, we don't necessarily, the one node does not necessarily know whether another node is correct or faulty. Uh, and we will come to the problem of fault detection in a little while. So we've talked about models for network, models for nodes. The third part is models for timing. And so here again, they are one of three choices that we could make. So the first choice we could make is a synchronous system model. And in a synchronous system model, we assume that basically everything takes a known length of time. So when we send a message over the network, there is some maximum time after which the message will be either either delivered or lost, but we assume that no message will take longer than some maximum amount of time to arrive. Also, we're going to assume that nodes always execute their code at a known speed. So every step of execution, every step of the algorithm, there's a, an upper bound for the length of time that that uh, execution is going to take. This is a very strong assumption. Now. Another assumption we could make is a partially synchronous uh, model where for some periods of time, the system behaves as in the synchronous model and for other periods of time, it behaves in a way that's asynchronous. And so I need to explain asynchronous. So in an asynchronous model, we make no timing assumptions at all. So that means if you send a message over the network, it may arrive in 20 years time, okay? We're not making any guarantees about how long it's going to take for messages to arrive. We assume no upper bound on message latency. Of course, it might be that messages are mostly delivered quite quickly, but we're just not going to make any assumptions about the maximum latency that might occur. Moreover, we're not going to make any assumptions about how fast nodes are going to execute the algorithm. So we're going to uh, assume that a node, node might pause its execution at any moment and just like stop executing its steps for a while and then later resume executing again. And of course this can happen because a thread can be suspended as you know, and so a thread can just pause execution for a while and then resume executing sometime later. Um, and so we have here the synchronous model as one extreme where, um, where like we're making very strong assumptions about uh, the network uh, latency and the node processing speed and the asynchronous model where we're making no assumptions at all. So the partially synchronous model is kind of a compromise between those two, where we're saying that actually the asynchronous model is, is great if we can work in the asynchronous model, but there are certain problems that simply cannot be solved in the asynchronous model. So in some cases, we do have to make timing assumptions, but at the same time, it's unsafe to assume that those timing assumptions are always true. Because if you write an algorithm in the synchronous model, and the system is ever asynchronous. If, there's, if the system ever takes longer than your upper bound to deliver a message, for example, then your algorithm might fail catastrophically. So the algorithms are very, very sensitive to your timing assumptions here. And in most cases, it is very dangerous to assume a synchronous model because real networks do in fact uh, behave in partially synchronous ways. So partially synchronous model is really our compromise where we're saying, most of the time the system is well behaved and kind of synchronous and occasionally it just goes weird and occasionally messages take a really long time to arrive and occasionally nodes are really slow to execute and then at some point they'll return back into a synchronous state but we don't know whether they are asynchronous or synchronous right now. 
So let me just explain the problems of assuming synchrony. So you might think that, you know, usually networks are quite fast and usually, you know, if you send a message, then it'll be arrived, it'll arrive within some maximum time. But unfortunately, there are lots of reasons why, um, why messages might take longer occasionally. And so one reason might be that uh, a message is lost and needs to be retried. And so like we had earlier, in our case of upgrading a fair lost link to a reliable link, the cost of that upgrade in reliability was that potentially we have to wait for a very long time. If there's a network partition, we might have to wait for minutes or even hours or even days before the message gets through. So in this case, we can't assume any upper bound really on, on message latency because it might be up to the length that it takes for a network partition to be healed. Other reasons why network latency might suddenly increase is just congestion and queuing in the network, or there have even been examples of a network reconfiguration where packets just get stuck in a switch buffer for over a minute before they're eventually delivered. And so even in, in data center networks, which are normally very well managed, it is possible to actually occasionally have really extremely high message latency. And so any algorithm that we design must take uh, must, must take into account this possibility that occasionally messages might take a very long time to arrive. In terms of the execution speed of nodes, again, we would ex expect normally like computers run at a kind of fixed speed, you know, a fixed clock speed. So we don't expect that to vary very much, but there are many reasons why a node's execution might be interrupted for a little while. So as you know, from the concurrent systems part of this course, you can have a context switch, you can have a thread that temporarily gets suspended while other processes run. And so this might take a while before the operating system scheduler comes back and starts running your thread again, especially if there's some kind of problem going on like priority inversion in the system. It could be that a, a, a process is actually paused for a significant amount of time before it gets to run again. And as you know from multi-threading, a, uh, a process can or a thread can get paused at absolutely any moment there's, you know, any point in the in the code, uh, it could decide to, to pause. And so even at the most inconvenient place possible in an algorithm, you might have a, a thread pause or a context switch. Another real problem that happens in practice is garbage collection. So in a language like Java, for example, which performs automatic memory, memory management and which uses garbage collection to free up memory, uh, you can have what is called a stop the world garbage collection pause where the garbage collector just has to stop all of the running threads for a while while it performs the garbage collection. And those pauses can last minutes sometimes if you have a large threat, large heap size. So that again is another reason why a, a process or a, a thread might just, just pause execution for a while. And uh, finally, of course, there are lots of other things in the operating system that cause variable uh, delays such as page faults and so on, especially if memory is tight. So it is possible to get around these things. So real-time operating systems will provide scheduling guarantees. They might guarantee that your code always runs runs at least once every 10 milliseconds. Um, but most distributed systems are not built on real-time operating systems. They're built on general purpose operating systems, which make no guarantees about how processes are going to get scheduled. And even if you are using a real-time operating system, it's very hard work to actually ensure that those uh, timing guarantees always hold. So for most practical distributed systems, we cannot assume any upper bound on how long it might take for both a message to be delivered or uh, a process to execute one step um, because, you know, uh, because these delays can occur unpredictably and non-deterministically at any point. So that's a summary. This is what we talked about. System model contains of, consists of three parts. There's, we can make an assumption about the network, how reliable we want the network to be, reliable, fair loss, or arbitrary. We make an assumption about how network, how nodes are going to behave. So are we going to assume crash stop, where crash means a node never comes back, or crash recovery, or even Byzantine behavior of nodes. And then thirdly, for the timing, we can choose between synchronous or partially synchronous or asynchronous uh, execution. And these uh, choices, of abstraction are absolutely crucial. So if you're designing a distributed algorithm, you have to be absolutely certain that your assumption of in regard to these are correct. So for example, if you're assuming a crash recovery model and actually you have some Byzantine uh, nodes in your system, the Byzantine nodes are just going to destroy your algorithm. So if you think they're going to be Byzantine 
uh, behavior, then you have to take account for it in the algorithm, and the algorithm has to be designed to tolerate Byzantine behavior. It, it is perfectly fine if you're going to assume this is a fully trusted system, it's not going to have any Byzantine nodes, and just assume only crash stop or crash recovery, that's fine. You just have to be very sure that your assumption is correct. Likewise, with timing, um, making synchrony assumptions, as I said, assuming a, a synchronous model when actually your system is partially synchronous is very dangerous. It's very likely that if you assume a synchronous model and it goes partially synchronous even just for like 10 seconds somewhere, the, all of the guarantees of your distributed algorithm are off. So you have to be very sure that your assumptions in terms of the synchrony model, uh, the node behavior and the network are correct.